Hey, everybody. All right, let's go ahead and get started. This is our sixth uh, LFS virtual filmmaker forum. I'm so stoked that all of you have been checking in for these and sharing them. Um, for those of you that are watching on our Facebook live stream on our uh, LFS page, if you would be so kind as to start a watch party, it really helps more people see what we're doing and take part in the conversation, uh, at least in the comments or been some good talkbacks and um, people connecting via our comments. And um, overall, just being able to feel like they're cl more closely connected to some great creatives that have a connection to our beautiful bluegrass state. So um, I'm really thrilled that tonight we have the creator of the Final Destination franchise, Jeffrey Reddick, joining us, and he'll be on here in just a moment. Um, I'm really excited that LFS is going to be doing a small online version of our Flyover Film Festival. We're calling it a Flyover Film Festival event uh, coming up a week from this Friday. We're going to be doing the online Kentucky premiere. It will be running for two weeks of River City Drumbeat, a fantastic documentary done here in Louisville on the River, uh, the River City Drum Corps, uh, as well as a, the premiere of a film called The Public Record, which is a fantastic insight onto uh, individuals throughout our community here in Louisville, um, kind of reeling and coping with the COVID ep epidemic as well as the uh, racial revolution that we have taking place here locally. So really excited to be announcing those this coming Monday and hope you all will join us for those online streams. But tonight, without further ado, I am so excited to have uh, Jeffrey joining us. Um, he has written and produced over 40, uh, 40 scripts for film and television, including Tamara, Day of the Dead, let's see, NBC series, uh, Midnight Texas. But I think that I would be remiss to say that he would be known mostly, uh, if I didn't say that he was known mostly for his fantastic creation of the Final Destination franchise. So I'm gonna bring Jeffrey on so we can get to asking him some questions together. Let's see. Here he comes. Let's see, unmute. Oh, technology. Let's see. All right. I think we got some magic happening here. I got a gray screen. Where is my guy? <laughs> I know you're more handsome than that, and then that gray screen's giving us. <laughs> Let me see. Um... Excellent camera. We had a good test run earlier and I got to see you in that great spot that you're in. So let me see. Hopefully we can have that. Let's see. I can stop video and then ask it to come back again. Let's see. Ask to start video. It doesn't look like it's working. Hang on. No problem whatsoever. Can Technology is, yeah, I can hear you beautifully. Okay, um, hmm. So I'm using my select camera, I'm using my FaceTime camera. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see. Maybe stop the video on your side and let me try it on my side. You got it. Let's try that, okay. And I can also pop you off to attendee and bring you back in. Okay, yeah, didn't, looks like it's not. All right, I'm gonna kick you off of here and then bring you back. One second. Thanks everybody for being patient. As you know, technology can be a jerk sometimes. Best laid plans. Now, unmute him. Ask to start video. I wish I could perform like a song and dance. While I know. <laughs> you don't want to hear me sing and you don't want to see me dance. So I would like to see that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that would be fun. We gonna save that for a different day. Okay. We're so not so live streamed FaceTime. Uh, let me try my other camera. I, yeah. We did test run this. We were, we we were so prepared. We were <laughs> so prepared. Everything worked wonderful. We did. It is all good. Um, do you see if he has here? Whoa, I see a finger. Yeah. Okay, that's another camera. Fantastic. Um, Thank you, little, Bonita. 
our, uh, some of our friends who are waiting here to hop on and talk to you uh we're asking we're giving suggestions yeah like, I, I had a i had a um external camera but it's very dark for some reason hey, um i think you look fantastic i'm just thankful i get to see you thank you it's uh, nice to see you too i know and so, um uh, <laughs> i it had definitely been a while um we actually met i think that it was sometime around like 08 2008 2009 um i think we were just that, kids well, just babes, babes. babes. I was like babies. barely walking. Um, <laughs> I know I don't know that that many people in Louisville or in Kentucky realize how many Kentuckians we have in LA. Yes, um, and that's where we met. It was like a Kentuckians of Los Angeles Society meeting. Yeah, um, I hadn't I hadn't been to too many of them before, but gosh, that room was full. I mean, there must have been like 150, 200 people there. There's a lot of us out here. Um, yeah. Todd Farmer is one of my best friends. He he's a horror writer as well, and he's done like my bloody Valentine and just a, like a hundred movies. He's like the nicest, you know, guy. But yeah, there's a lot of us out here. I found that it was really fun, not only for like game watches because I was out there when we won, when Louisville won the national championship, but like game watches and Kentucky Derby parties. There's something that feels really nostalgic and fun about getting together with fellow Kentuckians. No, it's, those, it's it is. It's very nice. Big days. So will you tell me a little bit about how you went from a boy in Eastern Kentucky to this incredible creative uh, who lives an exciting Hollywood life. Tell me a little bit about how you wrote that prequel to Nightmare on Elm Street, yeah. you admitted it at age 14, and now here you are. Tell me about yeah. that. Um, and I always like to preface this story. How do I do, how do I start this as a Facebook Live too on my Facebook, just not to... So, if you go to the, if anybody goes to the Louisville Film Society page, yes, so if you I'm go there. to Louisville Film Society and you scroll down and you see our little video, it will say share. And if you click share, it will say start a watch party. Uh, okay, yeah, let me go up here. Perfect. Now it's, it's only giving me the option to, um, it's not giving me the share option under the video. It's giving me a share option under our invitation, but under our video, it's just saying add a comment. Oh, okay, that's all right. We'll just focus on us. <laughs> it's just, and then also a great thing is though that once we're done, you can go on our Facebook page and actually just share and it will post it to your page and people awesome. can watch it there. It just won't be live, but people will see the post. That's awesome. Um, um, so yeah, like I always like to preface this story um, because I always knew that I wanted to to work in Hollywood or be in films. I love film and television since, since I was a kid. My grandma asked me, you know, when I was nine years old, what I was going to do when I grew up. And I said, be a movie star, which is, you know, silly. But I, you know, so this is something that I always wanted. So I always tell people, like, if, if creating is your passion from a young age, everybody in your life is going to tell you to get a real job <laughs> and study something that you can make a living at. Um, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't necessarily do that. I'm just saying that you know, if this is like really your calling, like you, you just, you'll know, you know, you'll know from a young age. And um, when I was 14, I saw Nightmare on Elm Street, which is my favorite movie of all time. And I wrote a prequel idea and I called information and got the name of the studio and the head of the studio, got his phone number, got their address and I mailed it to him. And I didn't have any master plan. You know, I'm only 14 years old. I'm like a little hillbilly back up with my little typewriter, writing up a pretty cheesy story now that I think back on it um and he sent it back to me at first because it wasn't through an agent and then i wrote him back kind of a, a little more aggressive letter and i'm like look mister i've seen three of your movies so i think you can take five minutes to read my story and you know and that's the hillbilly in me. <laughs> um and so he he responded and he got back to me and um i ended up becoming uh pen pals because we didn't have the internet back well yeah we didn't have the internet back then um so i would just write letters to his assistant and she would send me posters and scripts and so I started at a pretty young age, like getting a feel for what a script looked like and felt like. And when I was 19, I went to college in Berea, Kentucky, which is an amazing college. Anybody in Kentucky that's looking for a, a great education should could really consider it. It's a wonderful college. And um, I, during the summer, I went to New York to take acting, um, an acting course at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts for the summer. And because I'd built such a good relationship up with New Line over the time, they asked me if I wanted to be an intern there. And I said, absolutely. Um, and then when I got in New York, I started getting a little, some side acting gigs and stuff. And I got an agent. I'm like, well, 
I'm going to just stay in New York. And then I started working at New Line and um, worked there for 11 years. And it was funny because, yeah, they made they made my first movie. It took it took a long time. You know, it, I, I was 30 when Final Destination got made. So nobody has to do any math on me. Um, but, you know, I got to learn all about how the studio system works and all the the business side of the of show business. So I stayed in New York um, and I, w- I probably would have continued to stay there and work um, until 9-11. And then I decided, you know, I'm going to move out to LA. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's always, a, the d- landscape has changed now, but definitely probably fire, prior to five years ago, getting out to LA is something that most people have to do at some point in their career just to kind of get seen. But, you know, it all started with that letter and, um, and, Again, I didn't, I wasn't plotting anything. I was just following my, I had a story I wanted to tell Mm -hmm. and I wanted this guy to at least read it, you know? Um, Do you think that that kind of speaks to the tenacity that you need to have to be a filmmaker? Kind of like that, that drive? I think you need to have that drive, absolutely. Um, But I think that drive also has to come with getting an education and getting better. Um, Because, you know, my first, four scripts were, I thought they were brilliant when I wrote them, but I look back at them, I'm like, they're really bad. Um, so I think you have to have a combination of tenacity, but you also have to really put in the hard work. Um, and people do say, you know, I heard this from, I think it was Steven Spielberg, but somebody will someday correct me. I just keep saying it was him, but somebody will find out who it is. And they say, hey, it was this person. But they said, you know, you have to be willing to commit. If you're going to work in the arts, you have to be willing to commit 10 years of your life to doing it, like hard work, not just like, you know, easy work. You have to commit to like 10 years before you'll hopefully start getting work and that doesn't mean you'll hit the top of peak of your career that means you know till you get something done and it was actually 10 years from the day or the year that I graduated high school that I got final destination made so you know I was doing all the waiting tables you know temp jobbing going out on auditions the acting wasn't working out um, because this was the early 90s and um, I, I know that's not that long ago but the business back then, especially for someone who was a person of color, my agent was like, you're like an ethnic Michael J. Fox type. And I don't know what to do with that. You know, if you rapped or played basketball, I could cast you, but maybe I can get you like some work on the Cosby show. I don't know. Like there were, there were just, they were very short-sighted about like where I could go as far as an actor. So I decided to put that dream on hold and start writing because I still wanted to work in the business. So part of this was also being tenacious, working hard and then rolling with the business because the business is changing now. Um, you know, it's changed so much since, since I started and it's going to keep changing. So you've kind of, kind of got to roll with all that. Do you think it's more rapidly changing now than it was before? Yes. Yeah. I think the studio systems are, um, almost going out of style because if you look at what they're putting out, just from a business point of view, they're all putting out sequels, remakes, things that are based on like huge books like Harry Potter, um, and they're not really making original films. I, I use uh, Christopher Nolan as an as example. Um, he couldn't get ma- Inception made after the first Batman made all that money. He had to actually do two Batmans for them to prove himself to get an original movie made. So the studios aren't, they're so afraid of losing money because they spend so much money on their films that they don't want to take chances. But the good thing is now there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of new companies out there, production companies, you know, the streaming platforms now, it used to be like, oh, you don't want your movie on Netflix or Amazon. But now it's like, holy crap, my movie's going on. Netflix is making my movie. So, you know, the, the streaming platforms have gotten really, you know, they, they've got the prestige that they deserve and, you know, they're making content. So there's a lot more places to get your content made than there were when I started out. Back then, there were only like maybe five studios and then New Line was like a mini major studio. Mm. Um yeah. So yeah, the landscape has changed a lot now with the digital age. I'm going to um, bring on Bonita really quickly because she has a question a little bit about um, early early career moves. And so I'm going to bring her on. Let's see, Bonita, can you join us over here? I'm drinking out of my blue cup. There. Oh, I see the loyalty there. <clears throat> like, there she is. Let's hey, see. Bonita. Let me unmute you. Uh, Here you are. Okay. Yay. Hi, how are you? Technology. I'm good. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> I'm good. I'm doing really well. Thank you. Um, yeah. So my question is, so I'm an actor. That's mm-hmm. why I'm in this. So I've been doing this for about nine years now and uh, professionally. And so I do improv and sketch. So 
write sketch, teach sketch, creative writing, and I had an idea for a script, but I'm all like the format, you know, I don't know like the, the complete format. Anyway, make long story short, my director friend is like, screw the format, just make, you know, just write the film. Uh, so I wrote it, uh, she loved it, and we're actually going to shoot it. It's a short horror film. Oh, good. Uh, and my question is, uh, because I know like about film festivals and like the whole circuit uh, thing or whatever. So what happens after that for like beginning screen screenwriters? Like what, because I know like for like distribution and or, or like trying to get stuff picked up, like what is some advice that you can offer for- uh, Absolutely. And first of all, I want to, because you just saved me a whole lecture because you, you <laughs> no, because you, you did exactly what I tell, because a lot of people will say, I have a great script. How do I get an agent? How do I get it in front of people? And because there are so many people out there now and so many, again, people are, you know, they have studios have divisions that are just looking on the internet for stuff and looking at things like that. I tell people that if you're a writer and that you have, if you have a director person, a friend of yours, like get them to shoot something for you, like, you know, find people who can help you. So a director is always gonna be looking for something to write, actors, and they're gonna be looking for actors. So what you're doing is exactly the advice that I give people to do. So do what she says <laughs> um, if you're starting out, because you've, you've got to start just getting the experience. Um, I think for sure it's the, the festival route is, isn't a bad way to go um, to start with because it's, it does build up a cachet for the film and gets it seen, seen by people. Um, I will say it's what's great now, and it's it's just a course correction in the industry, and it's needed to happen forever. Is is people are looking at voices of women and people of color more seriously than than they did in the past. Um, like again, when I went in in the early '90s, I couldn't get cast on anything because I was light skinned, but a person of color, and right. so I couldn't play a gangster or a pimp, which is right. all they were offering. So, <laughs> and you know. Back then, they would have asked you to be a prostitute. You know, that's the honest. That's the truth. Like that's right, so yeah. the business is course correcting now. So, um, there, I think there are a lot of film festivals out there. Um, the hor just just the general horror ones, and then also uh, women in film festivals. You know, I would I would suggest submitting to some of those. Don't go don't go crazy and put yourself in, you know in a in a big hole spending money on all those right, things. But, right. but hit up some of the big ones. Okay. Um, and because I, that does, people do get their, uh, James Wan, who did the Conjuring movies, um, his movie Lights Out, he saw that at a festival. Um, and he, he bought the rights and had the director direct the film, film. And he put the woman who was in the film in the feature. Um, he just found another, he just saw another short at a festival that he loves. So people look, at, look for festivals that have um, professional, I hate to say celebrity, because that's such a stupid word, have right. professional people that are gonna be there and that judge the films. That's what I would look for in the festivals is who the judges are. Because if, if, I, see, if I see a great short, I'll, be, I'll send that to my friends. I'm like, you guys should look at this director or you should look at this actor or actress. So um, I do think that's a good way to go. And then, you know, if a lot of places like there's a shutter, the channel will, will they, they curate short films and put them on. Um, Amazon has short films now on their platform as well. But I think for someone who's starting out like you, who wants to have your voice you know, heard, I think the festival route's a really good way to go. Okay. And also you, you have such a unique look too. Like, I don't, you know, you know, I think, you know, again, that 15 years ago, we'd have been like, nothing for you all. Exactly. I'm in, I'm in the film I wrote. And it's crazy because we were just talking, you know, I had this idea of the pandemic and now we're shooting it. And it's like, yeah. what? This is crazy. And that's what I tell whatever your creative way that you want to work in the industry is like I I say surround yourself with pe good people who are like minded. Good people is important um, because there's a lot of, you know, I, I found in this industry it, when the idea of a movie getting get made gets thrown out like some people will like throw their mother under a bus to like get ahead <laughs> and you just don't want to have those people in your life because no. it just sucks your energy. They'll screw you over and you just don't need to be around that but find good people. Who are creative and kind of share your passion and work with them to make shorts and make you know you make a short and that goes with your feature script you know um it's it's great creatively to help you grow and it's a great calling card i think thank you so much thanks for joining us benita i'm, I'm glad you did thank you thank you and um,
so I am going to also just follow up. Bonita had a great question. So um, Steve Squall is a great creative here locally, and mm. he has recently completed a short film and he self-distributed. So uh, the festival route might necessarily not be applicable to him because it's already out there, but I yeah. think he had a question a little bit about some next steps. So I'm going to bring him on. Steve, come over and that's a great, yeah. <laughs> you are the best. All right, hold on one second. Okay, unmuting you. Trying to, okay, I see, see your handsome mug. Now we just need to unmute you. There you go. We good? We good. Hey, Steve. All right, hi, Jeffrey. Nice um, to meet you. Yeah, so my question is, is similar, I guess, to Benita's. Um, I wrote and directed a pilot episode for a series that I want to write and direct the rest of. Um, we put the episode out, it's on the, it's online and we've got a few hundred views, but I need to get a bigger, I need, I don't know how to reach a wider audience or get it seen by the people that could possibly give us the funding to make the next episode and like where, like kind of where do we go from here? Right. Um, my suggestion is, um, what genre is it? What? Uh, it's a post-apocalyptic, like sci-fi fantasy. Okay. So, you know, I would do a couple of things. Uh, send me it, you know, just send it to me on Twitter. I'd love to see it. But, you know, depending on the genre, I would say find media outlets like, you know, for, for horror, sci-fi, you know, Bloody Disgusting is really good. Fangoria, Dread Central. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of great sites out there. Um, sci-fi websites. I would just tweet them about or email them, tweet them now. Everybody's tweeting now. Um, it's crazy. Um, you know, tweet them about your short to see if they'd be interested in posting on their site. Um, and then I would look if you, since you already have a script, um, I would look for production companies that do kind of films in the same area that you that yours is, like, you know, post-apocalyptic, um, you know, probably not a crazy budget, obviously, because, you know, people aren't gonna put up a ton of money. On, right, a, on right. the first film, but if I, just look at the look at the production companies out there. You can just go on IMDb and check out movies, or scroll through Amazon and see what movies feel like the same type of movie or the same, you know, and just find out the companies behind those and just reach out to them with a, okay. a, a synopsis and log line and a, a link to the short and just see if they'll take a look at it. All right, cool. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for hopping on. Let's see. Let's. That's great advice. That's great advice. You know, I tell you, I love running the film society, but I'm, I'm a filmmaker first and foremost. So when I, the juices start going for other people, I'm like, they are for me too. I need to start shooting some stuff. <laughs> yes, you, you do, Susie. I do, no I do. I'm like, oh, no the pressure. last one only took me seven years. I'll be like, <laughs> geriatric by the time I finish, finish the next one. Um, not really, almost walking into the sunset. Um, Stanley Turner you got to come join us over here. Um, he's got a question for you, a little bit about how you got your work noticed, how he can uh, do that as well. He's coming over to, to join us. I, like, I don't know why I have to sing each time we're like waiting. For but that's good. It's like, it's like hold music, but better, much better. <laughs> Stanley just straight up disappeared. He did not transfer over. He is just gone. So why don't we switch over? Um, hopefully Stanley will come back on to the Zoom session. But in the meantime, I'm gonna go over to Evelyn Pollard and have her join us. Oh. Oh, I see Stanley. Sorry, Evelyn. And I we're see coming Evelyn. back to you in a minute. I will... Uh, we got Stanley on here and um, we'll be back to you in a minute, Evelyn. Stanley, thanks for joining us. Hi, um, nice to meet you. I'm Stanley, I'm in Dallas, Texas. Um, I'm a 14 year old aspiring filmmaker. And I just wanted to, and that's how, you know, you were 14 when you um, first sent your script. And I just wanted to know what, um, what was your process and how should I go about um, both networking um, and getting my work noticed as I like try to improve my skill set? Is there any like, internships or like anything I should be looking at right now so that I can improve my skill set, maybe look at some film schools, anything that you can recommend? Yeah, it's cracking me up because you sound way more smart than I did at 14 years old. So 
Um, <laughs> the thing, there's a there's a great filmmaking. Are you in Dallas uh, proper? Yeah. Or? Okay. Oh, um, Dallas, Texas. Yeah, da uh, yeah. So there's a there's a great filmmaking community in Dallas. Um, um, I'm trying to think. You know, internships I think are hard because because of your age right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just be very mindful of any place that that you go to work. You know what I'm saying? Like I would just bet everybody. There's there's just a bunch of assholes out. Pardon my French. There's a bunch of you know. There's just some. There's a lot of people in this business that talk a, a big game about what they can do for you and they can't. And so people will try to use that to kind of exploit people. Um, but I think. Um, do, so do you want to act, direct? I'm sorry, I missed. Um, um, I'm a aspiring writer director. I've that's awesome. sent a couple of films to some festivals through my school. Oh, that's great. So you're you're learning it. You're still at school. They have a film program there. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I would say keep doing keep doing that. Stay stay in school and keep using that for all it's worth. I, I don't mean that in a horrible way, but um, I know when I was in when I went to Berea, they didn't have a film program, but I was able to cobble together with my dean a couple of other programs to create one, so I could shoot. A, it was really bad. I had an afro and a half shirt on. This was all in style back in when I was in college, but um. But we were able to create like a film program and we had a small acting program at my high school with it, where they didn't have one before. So the fact that you've actually got some resources at school, um, I would say work, work with that as, mu as long as you can. I, I, I know how eager you are, um, but you're only 14 right now, which is, is great that you have these opportunities. But I, I would actually say, first of all, take advantage of all the stuff that you could do in school, like keep making shorts, keep making things to, to get a resume of stuff together so by the time that you graduate you know you'll have a whole bunch of stuff that you can show people because you, you have access to resources that i wish i had when i was growing up mm -hmm. um and in the meantime like you know i'll, I'll tell everybody that's on here just you know follow me on t twitter I, I just don't do instagram and and um you know obviously feel free to send me your short but um you know i i know some filmmakers uh, philip guzman directed um two projects that i worked on he directed dead awake and he, he did another project that i produced and he's one of the nicest people in the world. And I'm not, I know he likes to mentor people. Um, I don't want to make any promises for him, but I'm just, he's somebody who would, who would be a great mentor, I think. Um, and, but I would say stay, definitely stay in school and use those resources because you have something that a lot of us didn't have the access to when we were in school. So there's so much that you can do and so much growth you will make over the next couple of years. Um, so do some mentorship, but yeah. don't, don't, jump the gun to like so that you don't yeah, take advantage yeah. of all the stuff you have in front of you right now because the fact that you've already shot stuff in your 14 i'm like i did plays in my yard with a sheet when i was 14 that's all i did <laughs> like so <laughs> you're way ahead of the game right now friend <laughs> yeah thank you so much okay take care stanley best of luck to you thanks for joining us from texas that's fun. I love when people jump on that aren't native to Kentucky. I'm like, this does, you do not have to live in Kentucky to participate in this. You do not have yep. to live in Louisville. Like, jump on here. This is for everybody. So I'm yes. stoked he found this. Like, that just goes to show his resourcefulness right yes. there. That yes. he found this going on all the way over here. So way to go, Stanley. Um, so I am going to kind of switch it up a little bit and bring on Kirsten Plunkett, who has a question about making in a time of COVID. <laughs> Doesn't have the same ring. Love and color. Okay, here we go. Hello, there you are. Hi. Hey, how are you? you? Thanks for joining us. Good. Thank you. Okay, the question I have for you, Mr. Riddick, is do you find yourself having to let your focus and your thinking as far as going about your filmmaking now that COVID and the social distancing is going on? Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that's, it's, it's a two prong thing. And it's something that, that I feel like, you know, I always have to remind myself the whole world is going through this, but um, creatively it's a lot more hard for me to focus on work when I'm stressed out about the state of the world right now, you know, and everybody's, you know, being, you know, quarantined or having to wear masks and we're, we're still waiting to find out how bad things are. So when something like this is affecting the whole world, like I was in New York during 9-11, which was horrific, but it really affected 
it affected the world, but it wasn't physically affecting every community in the world. So um, we always have to, I think, to put our self care above anything else right now, because so many of my creative friends are like stressed and feeling blocked and they don't know what to do. And they're worried about when the business is going to open up and, and, and it's like, we just, and I, I do too, I'm not perfect, but I'm much better at giving advice than I am at taking my own advice, but I try when I give it, I, it sinks in more, but um, so just realize like any blocks that you have, don't like, don't be beating yourself up that you're not, you know, that you're stressed or, or like, oh, I wasted this day because the, you know, we're all, we're all going through the same thing. Um, fortunately, I've been able, I got a couple of writing things before COVID hit and I've been able to get a couple of more going. So, um, but it's been really hard for me to stay motivated, um, you know, on deadlines. It's been really, really hard. Um, and I've missed, I've had to push in deadlines off and people have been understanding, but it, it's hard to stay motivated as far as, um, how the business is, is going to go. It's, it's still kind of up in the air. Cause, um, I know in March they thought things would be opening back up in September, but I don't think we're going to be able to properly start making films, you know, into next year. Um, but that's going to be on a state by state basis, obviously, but, um, there's just a lot more precautions everybody has to take. Like, you know, if you can, if you can get a small cast and a small crew together, to go to one location, everybody's been tested for COVID and everybody's under contract that they're gonna go to set and then they're just gonna go back to the hotel and you rent it off the whole floor <laughs> so nobody else can spread it up there. Um, you can make movies under the, the, with those kind of parameters right now, but um, it's still too, especially on the studio level or big, bigger production level, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's almost too risky. Um, there are some people that are kind of going off to other countries and making them, or you can certainly go to a state, like if you, find a state where they've had like two COVID cases go there and shoot something. But, you know, it's, it's going to, it's going to change the business, I think fundamentally, because it's going to be a while before theaters will never go out. I don't care how many times people say, Oh, people are going to start streaming movies. Theaters will never quit being popular because we all love to go out as a community and watch something in a room full of people and laugh and scream with them. So that's never going to go away. Drive-ins have been doing really well um, now during the, this time. Um, so the industry is never going to go away, like from making theatrical movies, but it's going to take a while before they kind of figure out exactly how to handle the, the COVID thing. Cool. I feel like I gave a big old COVID speech on that. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah. My, my question completely. I was just curious, like just knowing from you being one of those filmmakers that, you know, tends to put things out there and we want to see if it goes, like, how is it just affecting you, you know? Yeah, no, just it's, it's just, I can still write scripts, you know, which is great. I can, but as far, you know, I can still go out with scripts, but, it, you know, they have to be packaged and it's, it's with the understanding, like, we might buy this, but we don't know when we're going to, we have a whole, you know, we had to shut, you know, studios had films that they were almost done shooting. They had to shut down. Then they had films they were starting shooting. Then they had films that were in pre-production. So there's a whole line of scripts at all the studios and production companies that are like ready to go when, when this COVID thing goes away. Um, and there's a lot of juggling of cast now because some people may not be available. Um, so it's going to be a while, but you know, as a writer, you can still sell scripts, but they're, you're, it's not going to be as easy selling material as it until this has really kind of gone over or rolled over. Thank you for answering my question. Oh, thank, thank you for you asking. Us, Kirsten, have a great night. Thank Take you. Care. You too. Have a blessed night. You too. So it seems to me, I've noticed that it appears like more documentaries have been able to get up. At least it had the talking heads element. Yeah. Uh, I've noticed some of those have been starting to gear up in Los Angeles. Some of my friends at work on those and, you know, the behind the scenes photos of like plexiglass and oh, yeah. masks. And then, you know, they're like 20 feet away with crazy different different lenses than they would have ever used before yeah. and teaching people how to mic themselves it's been very interesting very inspiring to watch people flex and you know and pivot and, and, yeah. and try to do new things to keep content being created but at the same time when you talk about that big traditional set uh that is not currently happening that's not happening yeah yeah. So, you know, I'd love to shift a little bit and, and ask you about, so you are the first person of color to create a billion dollar film franchise. Like just even saying that I, I have chills. <laughs> so I, I just want to ask a little bit about 
how that journey was, what were the challenges that you had? And, um, you know, that's a huge, huge achievement, but there had to have been some roadblocks along the way. I know you had a great, you know, inroad into New Line, but did you find challenges along the way to get to that billion dollar status? Um, it's funny because it, again, it's almost like when I was at 14 year old, you know, in Kentucky and I, I just kind of kept tr tr trudging along and not, not, um, I didn't have any master plan in, in, in mind for that. Um, I think, it, you know, I just, I face a lot of the challenges that, that most people face in the business, you know, um, it's just getting your work seen, um, writing something that's like going to connect with people. Um, and, and it's, it, I, I think I'm probably the first person of color to do a horror franchise. I, I don't know if I'm the first, I, I, sh I would check that one just cause I don't want to, but it never even hit me till somebody told me this I mean, literally like, I do have horror film franchise in my notes. I, I must have just crossed that part out. I will double check that fact. Oh, but, but it is funny because people, way, I didn't even know, notice yeah. that until people mentioned that to me. Um, I, I wish that I had some of those billions. <laughs> I wish I had much more of those, but um, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm really glad the film struck a chord with people, but you know, it, it really, um, from a writer point of view, I just, ex I didn't, I experienced just the regular frustrations of, you know, I mean, New Line had a really hard time. Like, how are we going to do a movie where death is the killer and you can't see it? Like, that doesn't make any sense. So I, even though I worked there for 11 years, it was still hard for them to get their mind around this concept, which was, which you know, was original for sure. Um, and they just, you know, they almost didn't make it. It wasn't until we threatened to take it to Miramax, um, Harvey Weinstein's company, which thank goodness we didn't end up there. But, you know, it wasn't until we threatened to take it there that they were like, okay, we'll make it. Um, so the road, I guess the biggest roadblock I, I had with that one was getting them to take a chance on something original, you know, like they hadn't seen this movie before. Um, it didn't fit their paradigm of what a horror movie, successful horror movie was. So the biggest roadblock was trying to get them to take a chance on something that was different. Um, and, you know, none of us knew that the film would take off. I think the the reason that it did, you know, I, I give, a, you know, so much credit to their the director, uh, James Wong, and his writing partner, Glenn Morgan, who directed the film and also did a did a big rewrite on the script and I think made it more universal when they did. And I think the, the script, um, that prop property in particular has done so well because it, tr it does translate internationally. Like usually when the film comes out, half the box office is, you know, from domestic and half is from foreign, but as the sequels went on, it started actually picking up a lot more in foreign box office than domestic. So we were still doing really well in the States, but the movie traveled really well internationally. Um, and because they could be made on a budget and, you know, we didn't put any belief system on death. We just kept death as a force. So people from all different cultures and religions or people who don't aren't religious could project their fear of death into that movie without feeling like, oh, well, that's not, you know, that's not a Christian death or, or Buddhist death or Muslim death reaper. It's just death. Um, so, you know, I always figured we'd have a sequel just cause I always try to write horror films for sequels, but I didn't, you know, you, I didn't know it would take, it was a true word of mouth hit. Like it opened at like number three at the box office and then it started climbing to number one and then it stayed at number one for a while. And then it stayed in the top 10 for a while. It was, it was a really word, word of mouth hit. So it was fun to see that happen again. That's out of my control. Um, you know, but magnificent. I mean, what is, yeah. what a success story. And even like Steve Squall and I were talking earlier when he was um, submitting some stuff to, to hop on here. Like we owe it to you and to your film franchise that we are forever frightened of driving behind semis with. Oh, and you know, the great thing is um, for, cause I always, I always, always, I always give Kentucky props because um, when we were, I came up with the first idea for the first one, when I was flying home to visit my mommy in Kentucky, but I had written the story for Final Destination 2 and the original opening was going to be like kids going to spring break and they stop at a hotel and there's a fire. And the producer was like, oh, I just, the fire, we got to come up with something better than that. So I hate driving. And I, you know, was going home to see my mom and I got a rental car from Avis and I was driving back to see her and I got behind a log truck. It's like, I hate these log trucks. And then it hit me. And then I pulled off the road and I called the producer. I'm like, what about a friggin' log? I didn't say friggin', I said the other word. What about a friggin' log truck on a highway? And he's like, what, what, slow down. I'm like, what about, they're driving down the highway and there's a log truck and the chain breaks in the lock. And he's like, that's it. So um, 
I still get memes about log trucks today, but that's all, that's all Kentucky. <laughs> okay. Oh, and so that is why it continues to haunt us. We're the land of, uh, I was going to say, I have, um, this is where having like a notebook, either in your car, in your purse, like in yes. your backpack, because there's inspiration at every turn. I, I think that many people that are disconnected from film think that a, a screenwriter might sit down and just like have these, you know, these thoughts where it's like, oh, I just put together a whole script. You're like, well, actually like log truck. And then what can I create around a scene? Like how do these yeah. build? And when you just throw down one idea, it's incredible how things continue to branch off of that. Right, because you don't know, you, sometimes you'll have an idea or a character, but you don't have the story for them yet. And that's what that's what was going on with, um, you know, with Final Destination. I, I saw the, an article about a woman whose mom said, "Don't take the flight you're on because I have a bad feeling." And I thought, "Oh, that's interesting." I was actually on a plane when I read it, but I didn't immediately have like an idea about like a feature film about it. I was just like, "Oh, this is really cool. What if she cheated death?" And I just remember I wrote that down as a note. I didn't get back to that till like three years later, you know, and then, and that was because I was writing a. a sample for an x-files episode i was like what's a cool opening for like an x-files and then i remembered that idea so then i put that idea in and then the story kind of went into that and then i got an agent off that script but then my friends at new line were like you shouldn't don't turn that in the x-files keep that as that's a good feature idea but it's a pro like you never know when inspiration is going to hit you but it doesn't mean immediately like a story is going to pour out of you you know um it, but it's always good to have a notebook just to write random random ideas thoughts down. and like yeah. don't let your friends see it not only because you want to keep your thoughts private but because then they'll get into the mind the warped mind where they're like yeah Why did they'll you be like what is wrong with you log trucks <laughs> smashing people's heads in <laughs> yeah and you're like that's the winning idea you just don't know yet. <laughs> um so tell me like at, as far as being creator writer co-writer sometimes producer other times is it hard to wear different hats on a project and a franchise that's your own baby um, it's not for me, but I, I, I really think it's my personality. I think that working at a studio, I, I learned from an early age that the creative choices that are made a lot of times for a film aren't based on creativity, but based on like m money or business decisions. Like most of the studios, if you look at the heads of most of the studios now, they all come from a business background. So they're not used to really thinking creatively about stuff. So that's why you see a lot of, you know, blockbusters that kind of, they're great, but a lot of them just feel like the same formula they just stick different people in them um and um so i learned at an early age not to take that stuff personally uh so so i was able to kind of separate my ego somewhat it still hurts a little bit obviously if somebody doesn't like your work but i know some of my friends if their first script doesn't get picked up they get crushed and they're leaving the business and it's like you can't do that because 20 people can pass on your movie yes. And then, you know, everybody in town passed on Nightmare on Elm Street. And finally, Bob Shea at New Line told Wes Craven he could make it. You know, every studio had passed on it. Um, Kevin Williamson was about to leave the business. And he went up to a cabin. And he's like, I'm going to write one more script. And if it doesn't sell, I'm out of here. And, you know, because he'd got to the point he was going to leave. And thank God he didn't. He wrote Scream and kind of reinvigorated the genre. And, you know, is a, you know. so um for me, putting on different hats, it's, it's kind of happened organically over the years, like, you know, starting off acting and writing, then putting people together to create movies is like, you know, okay, that's producing and then executive producing. So, um, you know, I did direct my first film this year, which was terrifying and fun and, um, you know, a, a great, very guerrilla style, but very fun movie. To, it's actually gonna be coming out in October um, so I finally checked that box off and, um, was happy with how it turned out. So I'm looking forward to directing more in the future. Um, cause if you want, if you, if you're a writer and you want what you wrote to end up on screen, you have to direct it. That's the only way it'll ever happen. But that also means you have to finance it <laughs> probably. Um, so it was fun to direct my first feature and then I'm looking forward to doing that again. But for me, it's all about work creating stuff that ends up being seen by people so whether it's released on cable whether it's released on tv whether it's released online like or on the big screen like i just want people to see i want to make work that people see and hopefully it, are moved by it so talk to me about that then because don't look back is the name of your directorial debut correct yeah and so um what is so releasing a film in the the world and the element the climate we're in now 
how is that how's it going to go has it gotten pushed back what is your plan um, no the plan is the plan um uh gravitas ventures is putting it out so they're going to put it out on you know digital platforms um but they're also they were going to try to do a 10 city release uh before you know for a week before the movie came out but if covid still is unsure as it is now we probably will not do that but hopefully we can get into some drive-in theaters um, but sometime in October, it's going to be coming out. But yeah, I, our theatrical release was going to be like a limited, you know, 10 city, 10 major market release. But unfortunately, the 10 major markets are the ones that are being hit by, by COVID. So I think, you know, we'll hopefully get into some drive-ins. And if not, we'll be coming out. Um, and you can watch it on, on demand or online. So I'm excited. Awesome. We'll have to keep us posted on the official date so we can make sure that we share it uh, on our page because we're always um, proud to promote uh, filmmakers with connections to our state. Um, I'm gonna bring on Evelyn Pollard here for a quick second, speaking of which wants to ask a little bit about being here in Kentucky and being a, a writer. Here we go. Evelyn, are you with us? There she is. Okay, wait, let me unmute you. Um, loving that, loving that backdrop. So you're, are you calling from Alaska, where is that, Alaska? Or? No, actually, you know, I wrote a script and this is South Africa, this is Cape Town, South Africa, and I, I'm oh. finishing up my residency. And so that was my background for my residency. Oh, I'm, actually, nice. I'm actually in Louisville. Awesome, well, it's nice and, to meet you. Nice to meet you too. So my question is like with everything that's going on right now. I know that's the big question. Um, like about not being in LA or possibly never going to LA and writing scripts, you know, what's, what's your best advice to writers? Um, um, yeah, I don't, I, it's funny because when I, I was going to stay in New York and write and not come to LA, I think the, the biggest thing that coming to LA did for me was just, it helped people put a name to the face. Like they could, there's just something different. Like people that I had talked to for years, you know, we only met for like coffee for two minutes and then they're like, okay, you can write something now. <laughs> Cause it was just putting a name to the face. Um, I think that may not be the rule much going forward because I think we, we've, with the COVID times right now, people are getting so used to doing meetings on Zoom. Um, you know, like all the writer's rooms have moved over, you know, I'm working on a couple of animated shows and they're, they're all Zoom. Mm -hmm. um, every pitch meeting, I've, I've not had a face-to-face -face meeting since February, and I probably won't for the rest of the year. So um, it's probably not going to, I don't think coming to LA, even though I mentioned that early on, I'm, I don't think it, coming to LA is going to be as important because there's a lot of a lot of filmmakers out here and a lot of companies out here that they're just getting used to this COVID kind of communication. Like I know people that say, I never want to go back. I don't want to work in the office again. Um, but you also now have access to a lot of the film communities all around the, you know, the United States and the world. Like I'm working on a couple of projects for a Swiss company right now and wonderful creative people. Um, but also, you know, have communities in Atlanta and Louisiana and Florida's, you know, burgeoning again, blowing up their film community and Texas has a thriving film community. So um, I think now is probably even a great time, especially because we have a lot more time on our hands because we don't, have to go out and travel or we can't go out and have fun and live um is to just research you know and find you know what what genre do you write in more drama drama uh, yeah coming of yeah, so, age so you know i would say just start looking at film community looking you know at, again looking for films that are kind of like czech films that were shot in texas or filmmakers in texas or baton rouge or you know there's a lot of other opportunities out there you know because there's a lot of directors and and finding directors i think if you're a writer for me that my advice is just try to pair up with the director if you can okay. um because a lot of the directors you know and will know producers who have some access to financing but they don't have a script and you know what i'm saying so um okay. you know i think connecting you know virtually is, is a smart thing to do at this point okay okay thank you and stick with it it's like you know it's not, saying, it's not overnight so yeah i'm sure you know that so like by using twitter <laughs> and using some of the social media outlets um you know like jeffrey was saying if people reach out to him on there he responds so i think that we're in a different time and place where if you're a fan of somebody um they're more accessible than they ever were because where jeffrey could look up numbers of 
executives back in the 90s and just give them a call. Um, mm -hmm. Then we kind of had this weird time where like everything got super secretive. There wasn't exactly social media. There was always the receptionist that was like the guard and you could never like get your script in without a release or a request. And now that we are in the social media age, you can just at somebody and all of a sudden you're talking right to Jeffrey. And right. that's a pretty empowering time. Yeah. Right. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Evelyn. Bye. Um, so I'm actually, I'm gonna bring on uh, Jennifer very quickly because she had a question that was in a similar vein. So that might've answered her question, but she might have potentially um, have a little different slant to it. So let's see if that did the trick or if she has something to add to that. Hey, Jennifer, let's see, I have you muted. Let me unmute you. There we go, you're on with, you're on with Jeffrey. We can't hear you. Can you maybe unplug the headphone? Would that work by chance? Try one more time. I think we got you. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, we can. Oh, we can we hear can you now. Hear. Okay. Yeah. So How really are you? <laughs> um, so I have an option um, on a supernatural thriller memoir, mm -hmm. and I'm looking to find a producer and or writer uh, to attach the project to pitch to get it made. Um, yeah. I. I'm a writer myself and a producer myself, but this project is uh, written by a black woman. Uh, right. And it's not my story to tell, but I think it's a really amazing story. So I'm looking for suggestions about how to connect with um, a producer or writer of color who might be interested in, you know, at least reading the memoir and seeing if they if they see themselves in the story to attach themselves. Right. To. Um First of all, I think it's really great because people love projects that are already, that are based on books. Like that always is a huge, huge plus. So I would make sure your option is iron tight, first of all, right. and that it's, and that you have it for a while. Um, and I would, I would suggest, um, I, I don't know any off the top of my head besides the obvious, like Jordan Peele, who's got a production company. Um, but I know there's a lot of, there's a, there are a lot of actresses that have production companies. Like Viola Davis has a production company. Um, I don't know if um, Octavia Spencer has a production company, but I know she loves genre. So I would I would maybe look at some of these production companies um, because they'll have connections to writers that, you know, that they could put on the project. So I would, I would actually suggest again, make sure your option is like super tight so nobody can kind of sneak in and like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Book, yeah, so make sure that that's taken care of. But if I were you, since since you've got a book that's already come out, um, and if you know, I would just write up a really, you know, a very solid like intro letter, and I would just start reaching out to some of the, the production companies, um, either that have you know that are that are you know females of color who are actresses or directors. Um, I would just do some research on those companies and, and go straight to them because if they love the book, then they'll start packaging people on it for you. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And and how do you recommend I? Like when, when reaching out to them, do I tell them I've got this, this option and I'm looking for a production company? Are you interested? Is that the ask? Yeah, I think, I think you would just tell them you, there's a, this great book, you know, what, you know, what it's about, why you think it's important and, and just say you're looking to partner with somebody, okay. you know, to bring on a, you know, writer and director. Perfect. Thank you so much. It's very helpful. Um, thank okay. you for joining us, Jennifer. Uh, for those that might not know, would you mind explaining what an option is? Oh, an option is when you find a property and you pay the person a certain amount. Usually it's, you know, it's all the joke's been, it's usually a dollar, but um, you know, those days are changing a little bit, but you basically get the, the give the, it, whether it's a book or a screenplay, you give the, the person that wrote it gives you permission to like exclusively have their material, usually for six months to a year, it can go longer. And then there's usually a clause in there that if you're in active development, you can extend it by paying a little bit more money. Um, I always think because everybody's all about existing properties or intellectual properties, they call them IPs for short. Everybody's always like, what's the IP? So, you know, I have a friend who wrote a script that she couldn't sell anywhere. And then she wrote it as a book. And before the book came out, she sold it as, as to, uh, and she got to basically just 
give her old script. You know what I'm saying? So there's just something now in the, the business where it's a safety net. They feel if there's already an audience for something like a book, then there's a bigger chance that that audience will come to see the movie. So, you know, I always use Tate Taylor as an example. He, uh, he was friends with the woman who wrote The Help. Um, and so he convinced her to give him the option and, and for him to direct it. So they had a very tight deal. They were very good friends. And of course the book comes out and it's like a huge hit and everybody on the planet wants to direct it. And they're all trying to kick Tate Taylor off the project, but he has the agreement and he's like, no. And they're in that. So they let him direct it and the rest is history. Like, um, because you will find usually the first thing that somebody wants to do when they want to buy your project, they'll either want to bring on another writer to rewrite you, or they'll want to bring on another director. If they, if there's a director attached, they'll want to, you know, they'll want to do something. So it's, but if you option something, like if you find a really, really good book and you option it um, and you keep a good relationship with that author, um, I think that does help you as far as setting up a property, especially if it ends up, you know, if you're lucky enough to get like a book before it's published and you option it and it comes out and it's a hit, you know, that's a really good position to be in. Yeah. When I was in film school, one of our assignments in a screenwriting course was to find a book and option it. Oh. Um, that was a lesson. You know, I'm yeah. like, what am I doing? And then to actually find a book, I think that there are a lot of bestsellers that have almost been like pre-optioned before they even oh, come yeah. out because those are yeah. by known authors. But there are some really great books that are out there that have fan bases that aren't optioned. And if it's something that interests you, it's a great place to start. And like you said, it already has a built-in audience. So when you go to pitch it, you can say, look, this audience is already here. So it, yeah. it is a great place to start. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily think of that. They're always creating new material, but there are some great, uh, you know, places to start from. Um, I have one final question. Um, yeah. Charlene Holloway is going to come join us over here. Charlene, let's see if we can get you over here. Charlene, are you with us? Yes. Can yes. you, I wonder if your video, let's see if your video, there you go. Hey. There you are. Hi, Miss Charlene, thanks for joining us. Thank you for this invitation. How I'm are you? Hi, Jeffrey, to see you in person. Oh, thank and, you, it's nice to see you too. And even to know that you're from Eastern Kentucky. Breathitt County. How far away is that from Benham, Kentucky? Where, what part? Benham, Kentucky. It's um, not far I'm, from Harlan. I'm, it's not, it's a, it, we're near Hazard, Kentucky. I'm so bad with geography. Yes. We're next yes. door to Hazard. Oh, okay. Well, Benham, County. Is, Benham is close to Hazard. Okay, that's awesome. Yes. Is that where you're at? No, um, <clears throat> I'm an author. I'm mm -hmm. looking for some assistance in uh, my book is published, but my mother taught, she was the first black in Kentucky during the Great Depression to graduate from the IU world-renowned Jacob School of Music. And one of her first teaching assignments for Kentucky as a certified was in Benham, Kentucky, in oh, Eastern wow. Kentucky, yes. And that wow. was, I know. So I asked her if I could write her story, what included a lot of my uh, own history as well as a mm -hmm. civil rights activist for but I actually started chronicling her Whitlock family when I was a 12 year old Girl Scout in 1959 so I, wow I know so I was born in 47 so you know it's been a while oh, baby but yes so I'm a published author I just recently uh decided to um ask a hundred year old Dorrance Publishing Company in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to republish their link to the New York Times, the Washington Post, Black Enterprise, 300 national and international media sites. And um, yes, I joined the NAACP when I was 13. And Good for year, you. thank you, a year That's and a half great. ago, the president, I, I know you know of him, Derry Johnson. Yeah. Uh, he's president. CEO, he came to be our speaker. And you know, uh, they do give the out the NAACP Image Awards. Right. And yes, yeah. So 
Have you ever thought about, uh, I know you write horror and you've done great at that. Have you ever thought about writing a script for a biography? You know, what's funny is so many people have told me because, um, you know, where I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, it was it was basically me, my sister and two other uh, children who were biracial from grade zero through college. So they had never, and we both moved into the, my mom's from there. And so me and my, and the other brother and sister both moved back to Kentucky around the same time. So they had never seen anybody who wasn't white where we grew up. So it, it was, it was like growing up in the forties for the rest of the world. Wow. You know, I mean, I'm sure you, you understand what it was like. Sure, so um, when I tell the people some of the stories that of my growing up there, um, and again, I, I love where I came from. I wouldn't change, change it for the world. I think it, it helped me grow as a person. I helped the people around me grow as people. Um, but people have been like, you should write your story. And, you know, I will at some point, I just want to figure out the right way to do it. Sure. You know, because I, I don't, I haven't, um, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know. I, you know, I didn't, I was born, you know, at a time like the civil rights movement passed. So I wasn't a, a part of that great movement. Um, you know, I feel like I blazed some trails as far as, is um, inclusion and 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 stuff like that, but there's a, there's part of me that feels like I haven't been in any part of a significant enough movement to oh, <laughs> to write a story about it. I don't know. Like I um, I think I have a lot of interesting, fun stories about growing up, but um, yeah, I don't. I would have to find the right venue, and I think it would probably be more of like a stand by me, like you know, a, a biracial kid growing up in, in the deep South, or, you know, we, we weren't technically the South, but it, you know, they, they wish they were the South, <laughs> um, by the way, people acted. So I think there would be a good story to be told there. I just have to figure out the right way to tell it. Sure. Sure. I understand. Well, you know, Louisville became the first city in the South to have the public accommodations of integration. And I was part of it. Oh, and wow. I, yeah, Dr. King came here a lot in the 1960s, and I had the ch chance to shake his hand and speak to him and uh, se on several occasions. And, you know, right now they're having the funeral for John Lewis, who yeah. brought his book here. But I had the opportunity to meet him and speak to him at a Congressional Black Caucus in D.C. So my book is pretty filled with a lot of history, multicultural. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. I was just wondering, would you ever be interested? I know you're having in October, you're going to release your digital, your digital platform and uh, and drive-ins and all. But um, I'm interested in that option about six months to a year to someone to uh, maybe think about it or read uh, a copy. Yeah, I mean, that, that usually what happens, and I, and I, I want to bring up something just because I, you know, since we're talking uh, uh, to the K Kentucky um, Film Society, you know, Berea was also the first um, college to desegregate mm -hmm. um, in Kentucky. And, right. and again, I can't, I can't praise that college enough. I, I went to, and this is no offense to Eastern Kentucky or UK, I went, I went and checked out all the colleges and what, cause I was a theater major. So I went to watch plays at all the colleges and mm -hmm. the other two theaters had really, super flashy plays uh -huh. that were like oh this is really flashy but Bria did had you know um one of the professors and one of the great actors there um Shanningers and uh, um Greg I'm blanking on his last name was the actor but they did of Mice and Men and it was a simple mm -hmm. production but it was the acting was so powerful that I'm like I have to go to this college so um again if you're if you're thinking about going to college you know when you graduate high school definitely give Bria a look um but you, yeah usually with an option um what will happen is a producer or somebody will, will read a book that they really want to do and they'll say, oh, let me option this and see if I can get get financing for it. Um, I think, you know, especially it sounds like your book's going to start kind of having a resurgence with some with publishing and stuff like that. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to turn, you know, to have it turned into a to a film, um, you need to make sure you have the well, it's your you said it's your was your mother. 
my mother was the school teacher. I'm a retired registered nurse. Okay, so, she so, was a, so your mom will let you tell her story. Well, she um, allowed me. She did. She, will, she did, yeah. gave me permission. So, and I own the copyright, but um, and she's deceased now. But um, I really feel that it would make a great film. And I love my city. I'm proud of where I'm from, Louisville, mm -hmm. Kentucky. And the first black RN in Kentucky was named Mary Merritt. And she attended Berea College mm -hmm. and graduated from there, but she couldn't become an RN. So she went to DC and enrolled in Freedman College where she got her RN, came back to Kentucky taught LPNs at the Red Cross Hospital, the first black hospital in Kentucky, where I was born. Oh, that's, <laughs> so yeah, I that's, have a lot of history. That, that is, that's fascinating. I it's mean, such a beautiful small world, uh, you know, th with Berea, with Eastern Kentucky, with all of this. And, um, you know, I think that if you don't mind me summarizing, just because we have to wrap up is just that it's fantastic that you own the copyright to it, because that means that you would be able uh, to option that out to somebody who would have uh, interest in it. So I, I know Charlene from coming to some of our networking events and being an LFS member. So continue uh, trying to get your film out there. That's what we're all doing is continuing trying to create and get our work out there. So thank you so much for jumping on here uh, with us and with Hi. Jeffrey. And I hope to see you again in person. Okay. All right. All right. We all take take care. Um, it's a. Uh, it's so different now. You see people on Zoom, and you're like, "Hi." Just wish I could <laughs> miss. Oh, so we have a normally have quarterly networking events, and so uh, these filmmaker forums were kind of born out of the desire to continue a connection and a conversation about creating. So I thank you oh, so great. much. Uh, for being on here with us. Uh, so do you have any plans? I know that um, to, you used to come back more often to visit your beloved mama uh, yeah. and your, your beautiful mama and sister. Um, yeah. Do you still come back here? Or what, do, do you ever plan on coming back? Do you ever want to shoot here? Yeah, no, I'd, I would love to. Um, I mean, my, you know, my mom has passed, unfortunately, but um, you know, I still feel she's with us. But my beautiful sister, Shana, lives in Winchester. Um, so yeah. Um, you can see her picture on my Facebook or on my Twitter. So if you ever see her, you can pick on her, please, please, please pick on her and tell her Jeffrey told you to. Um, <laughs> um, and I would love to shoot in Kentucky. Um, Kentucky has a good tax incentive program, but it's kind of broken up by county. And the only issue with shooting in Kentucky is it's, it's hard to cr get a full crew at this point, you know, to crew up a, a really sizable crew there. So you have to bring in people. And, you know, Atlanta right now has such a huge, you know, they're shooting so much stuff there that people are feeling, you know, all the people in Atlanta are getting pulled into projects and then people are coming in and going there. So I think once they kind of get a stronger kind of crew flow in Kentucky, I think that it's going to can be a very major player because I know people always talk about it. It's just, I know the people that have shot there have just been, just said that, you know, the the crew base and the foundation isn't solid enough yet to take a big production down there, but it's definitely grown. I know when we had a, we had a boost to our incentive, um, definitely around 2015 and, mm -hmm. uh, in the three ish years that that existed, that was very much like floodgates were open. A lot of productions were coming to town. Yeah. Um, we even had, that's when I moved back from LA yeah. and I know there were other people that moved here and people that left, their jobs that were kind of like subsidizing, subsidizing their creative work uh, to be able to do gaffing full time AC yeah. work. Um, so I, I hope next time you're here, uh, we can create some sort of networking event because we actually do. I think that our crew, uh, at least especially here in the Louisville and Collar counties, um, we've definitely bolstered up. So we can't That's wait great. to try to impress you and coax you back here uh, <laughs> and shoot something because gosh, we would love to have you here. So yeah. But in the meantime, I can't thank you enough for spending an hour with us and sharing of some course. of your beautiful insights with all of us. And thank you for keeping the you know creative spirit alive in, in, in Louisville. And you know, again, there's a lot. I've I've grew up with a lot of creative people. There's a lot of creative people in my family, and you know, the arts certainly aren't aren't celebrated anywhere like they should be. But it, you know, in education, again, it's like 
I had to tell my mom I was majoring in like science when I was majoring in theater. And then when I got my first play, I'm like, all right, come see my play. I'm in majoring in theater. And she's like, I knew you were doing that. Um, so it's just great to, see, you know, it's great to just talk to other creatives out there and see what you're doing. And that Stanley kid is impressing the heck out of me because I can't believe you the same age as me. <laughs> I know, I know. He's amazing. <laughs> he sounded so like had, six years older than me. He had another question for you. So I'm going to have him and anybody else. Could you tell me what your ad is on Twitter so people can go ahead and reach out to you? Oh, it's um, at Jeffrey A. Reddick. So my name, which is my middle initial. Love and, um, it. So hopefully, Stanley, you can head over there. Steve, send him your, uh, your first installment, your pilot. Um, and just again, Jeffrey, thank you so much. As I told absolutely. you, I always love and your If it takes me a bit to get back to people, if it takes me a bit, get, bit to get back to people, I'm swamped, but I, but you I'm do. You, you got back to me too. I know Look, I do. We're here. I do. I Probably do. Happened. Oh, All right. Take I wish care. you a great night. And thanks again for you being too. with us. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. A uh, huge thank you to everybody for tuning in, for anybody who hosted a watch party. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support of LFS. Uh, we can't wait to host another one of these here soon. Uh, please keep your eye out for that, as well as upcoming uh, virtual screening events we'll be announcing next week. Um, if you are so compelled, we would love for you to visit louisvillefilmsociety.org and either become a member on the membership tab that's there or hit the top banner, make even a, a $5 donation. It really helps us uh, keep these going. Uh, during these very interesting times. Uh, but thank you again for those of you tuned in. Please feel free to share this uh, on your Facebook page. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Everybody take care and uh, stay healthy and happy.